We're going to go ahead and call to order the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority meeting. Please uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We'll now have a roll call. Chairperson William McCurdy. Present. Vice Chairperson Tig Sagerbloom. Here. Commissioner Marissa Brown. Present. Commissioner Nancy Bruni. Absent excuse. Commissioner Richard Turchio. Here. Commissioner Gary Cox. Present. Commissioner Michael Disman. Present. Absent excuse. Oh, present. Oh, Commissioner right. Lachana Turner. Present. A quorum is present, and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to public comment. This is a time set aside for uh, the public to come forward to speak on items that are listed on the agenda. If you would like to come forward at this time, we ask that you please state your first and last name for the record, and your comments will be limited to two minutes. All right, seeing no one, we'll now move on to item number three, approval of the minutes from our April 25th, 2024 board meeting. Motion to approve the minutes. We have a motion by Vice Chair Sagerbloom. Is there a second? Second. We have a second by Commissioner Cox. Is there any discussion on that motion? Hearing and saying no, move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Motion is approved unanimously. We'll now move on to item number four, approval of the agenda. Motion to approve the agenda. We have a motion by Vice Chair Sagerbloom. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Churchio. Is there any discussion on that motion? Hearing and saying no, move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Agenda is approved. We will now receive a report from our executive director, Mr. Jordan. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. Well, a few things I wanted to cover, but I wanted to start, a, start my report. Uh, if commissioners if remember a few months ago, we had our CMAP score. That's our voucher program score. Um, that, that score wasn't as stellar as we were accustomed to. And uh, staff and I committed to a monthly process and, and also coming back to you to let you know what the results are as of um, year to date. And so Rosa Garcia from the uh, voucher program is going to update um, the board and the community on where we are with CMAP. Rosa? Good afternoon, Commissioners. This is Rosa Elaine Garcia, Director of Housing Programs uh, for HCB. So we did have our um, CMAP uh, for quarter two, and I am happy to say that we're one point away, 1% 1 away from high performance. Our score was 120, last time was 95, and right now our score is 89%. Once we get 90%, we will become high standards. And, and Rosa, last what, what were we a, f a few months ago when we were concerned? It was 70%. Yeah. Okay. So it, it has been a huge improvement. So we're, I'm very confident, and my team also is very confident, that for next quarter we will be high standards that I can. And between then and now, Commissioner, uh, we, we've invested in a lot of training. Um, you know, clearly some of the things that that we missed the first time around uh, were a lot was contributed to new employees training and things of that nature. So we're spending a lot more effort in making sure that we're sending out a quality product. Correct. Yes. If I could follow up. So when we go back to DC and you know, lobby for these additional vouchers, this is a score that we can hold up there and say, well, well the, the score, yes, any, any score, CMAP, utilization of vouchers, partnership with landlords, all those things that we're constantly talking about. Um, again, you, you know, back when we had the, the year-end CMAP, it would have been a tougher conversation for us to have because, yes, they would have looked at that as well. Any questions, I'll be happy to answer. I wanted to make a comment, and, and I believe that's part of uh, the evaluation uh, that we had set forth for the director. So it looks like you're moving in a great direction. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. A couple other things I wanted to mention. Uh, um, the um, and Rosa, you could have done this, but I'll do it. 
We received a 2024 Family Unification Program Award from HUD. And uh, the Family Unification Program is one of our boutique programs that allows us to reconnect fam uh, families. And through our voucher program, we were acknowledged by HUD. Um, wanted to um, thank all of you who participated in the Housing Choice, Vouch Housing Choice Voucher um, Choice Neighborhood Initiative. I, as you, I'll tell the audience, we are a uh, finalist for the $50 million grant from HUD. We're one of nine finalists. And on May 14th, uh, a team of folks from HUD came out to do a field evaluation. And we really showed a tremendous amount of collaboration, collaboration and partnership. Uh, we're waiting. We're waiting to hear what the results are. Uh, Commissioner Segerboon, to your point, I was in D.C. a few days ago, and uh, I, I rang every bell and knocked on every door saying, I'm Lewis from Southern Nevada. We really deserve these dollars. Um, so we're expecting an answer coming um, very soon. One of the reasons, or the reason I was in D.C., I attended the Innovative Housing Solutions Expo. And what this was, it was a opportunity to look at alternative housing options, tiny homes, container homes, mobile homes. And if you can imagine on our national mall, all of these different types of homes set up. And so it was a, a, a three, four day process. HUD did some, uh, HUD sponsored it. And there were some presentations on how administratively we can work better together to free up some of the, the issues that often we have in looking at what, what I like to call non-traditional homes. So uh, very well time spent, or very um, time well spent. And, and yes, I, I made every plug I could to talk about the CNI. And I just got a, we're still reviewing all of the applications and a wait and see. So hopefully we'll get those answers soon. On uh, May 6th or May 7th, I think it was, we also had our affordable housing forum. And this is a forum where we brought folks from around the, uh, the region and around the country. The acting secretary of HUD was one of our guest speakers, as some of our commissioners were as well. And we really talked collectively about the need for affordable housing and how we're continuing to try and grow our efforts. And, and once again, the feedback that, that we received is that as a region, and, and I just want you all to know, we're one of the few regional housing authorities in the country. And when you look at the 3,500 housing authorities around the country, if, if I had a say, there would be more regionalization because you all represent different jurisdictions. Other commissioners represent different um, factors of our, our housing product. And it really brings some diverse thought to, uh, to the process. Wanted to recognize staff and our residents for our successful family day that we had a few days ago. Um, and also um, wanted to mention that we have, we have close to 400 units we call in the pipeline. And we're going through the approval process, uh, both new construction and uh, rehab. And I just wanted to report that those things are going quite well. Um, wanted to... Um, also acknowledge that I had the opportunity to represent the Housing Authority at the funeral services for former Commissioner Valerie Craig. And uh, I, I can't tell you all how much it meant, uh, not necessarily because I was there, but if you can imagine, I want to say thank you for the proclamations that you all provided. I mean, literally, there was a, a shrine, if you will, um, at her services from the Housing Authority you know, with the proclamations, uh, just, you know, tons of cards and, and well wishes. And uh, some, sometimes family doesn't realize how important other families are, how other family members are. And it was, really, it was really a wonderful opportunity to be there to represent us and, uh, and thank her family for, for sending us her way, or sending her our way. Um, also, I just wanted to mention that we lost one of our inspectors, Jeffrey Walker, long-term employee. Uh, he, uh, he passed, had a sudden illness, and a number, of staff, a number of staff and I attended his services this past Saturday. Um, we've talked about our apprenticeship program. Today was the orientation, so we're, we're up and running. 
you know, we have our folks in and had an orientation. We'll go through the process and hopefully as time goes on, we'll have an opportunity to ultimately hire some of those individuals as uh, full-time employees. And then uh, I think I hit everything. Uh, finally, uh, this morning, uh, Rosa uh, Latoya, who's our landlord um, liaison, and I were uh, special guests on the Morning Blend um, new show. This is a new show that happens here in the community. And our full intent, we had about 10 or 15 minutes to talk about the landlord um, incentive program. You know, so we went out, we, the message was we all own a part of, um, a part of this process in addressing the affordable housing crisis. So um, that being said, and before I give up the mic, I understand that we have our, some of our apprentices here. Folks who are in the apprenticeship, you guys stand up. Be recognized. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So for those of you, for those of you who don't know, um, the, the board last year approved us using funds to hire residents in a job training program. And uh, this is our first group of, uh, of uh, hires. And so we're going to work with them. Uh, Uniforms are coming. You know, I see they're, they're, they're all in their white T-shirts. We got some a little better for you. And, uh, but we're going to really work to make sure that we can develop skills and, uh, and transferable skills so ultimately these fine folks can become, become a part of our, our work group. And I want to thank HR and, um, and the rest of the staff who's been instrumental in, uh, in pulling this together. So, uh, so we're counting on you guys. There's a lot of opportunity. Uh, we recently had someone who started in the same program that you're in, and he worked for us for 33 years, and he retired. So um, the, be the best is yet to come. So that, um, that concludes my report. Any questions at all? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I just wanted to add thank you to Commissioner Desmond for the heart and initiative to see this program, and thank you so much, Director, for following through. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank you and the staff and everyone at the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority for the hard work that you do. I know it's endless. I know it's sleepless nights. I know it's the worry that you fill in your hearts and how you take that and you work hard every day to make a difference. And sometimes I know with organizations that I've experienced with you sometimes don't feel like you're getting anywhere, but I see that you're doing great, great things. And I hope you know that um, I would just like to express my gratitude as well. Thank, so thank you. you. Thank All you, right, Director. That concludes my report, sir. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll now move on to our consent agenda item number six. And this is uh, the approval to request a write off of outstanding tenant accounts, receivable, and vacated accounts for the periods ending March 31st, 2024, and April 30th, 2024. Can we just do a motion on the consent? Yep. Motion to approve the consent count. You have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by. Second by Commissioner Brown. Uh, is there any discussion on that motion? Hearing saying none, we'll take it to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Consent agenda item is approved. Uh, we'll now move on to section four, the acknowledgement of our department. Thank you. We have a number of people that we've lost since we last met. Um, the list is quite extensive, so we're just going to put up the list and ask for a moment of silence, please. Thank you. And um, if there was, I'm sorry? Jerry Neal's name wasn't up there. Okay. And we'll add Jerry Neal's name to that list as we give our thoughts and prayers 
as well as, as I mentioned earlier, employee Jeffrey Walker and uh, Commissioner Valerie Craig. Thank you. Thank you, Director Jordan. Uh, we'll now move on to item number eight. Approval of the annual independent audit report for a period ending September 30th, 2023. And I'll have Fred Heron, our CFO, present this item. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Fred Heron, uh, Chief Administrative Officer of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. Uh, each, week, each year we're required to uh, submit an annual audit um, by independent auditor um, for our fiscal year 2023. Uh, Dale Rector, um, uh, the principal of uh, Rector, uh, Rita, and, and Lofton um, performed the audit in this, this past fiscal year. On April the 18th, we had an exit meeting uh, where he discussed uh, my management letter as well as one of the findings uh, that came out of the audit. Um, we are asking the board to approve this item um, um, as of uh, September 30th, 2023 audit. Um, Dale is available by video to do a slight presentation, a brief presentation of his findings. Mr. Director. Fred, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jordan, thank you for your leadership and for your constant, um, for the last four or five years, everything has seemed to calm down and new developments have come about and I appreciate your uh, your leadership and I appreciate Fred's uh, leadership in the area of finance and accounting. It's, uh, it's gone real well over the last few years and we've seen good things happen even though it's been in the middle of COVID and then subsequent to COVID. And let me say this, let me preface this by saying that most <coughs> of the agencies around the country have experienced some form of findings uh, mainly due to turnover of staff and a lack of uh, uh, employee uh, consistency. And one of the issues that came out of this audit was exactly that with turnover of staff. And we'll get to the finding here in a little bit. But basically, uh, with, the, with that exception, everything else is, is, is really good. The compliance is really good. What we look at in an audit report I've summarized it on the on the second slide, and it shows basically uh, we have three audit opinions. You'll notice there's no material weakness. There is a noncompliance, but it's in a noncompliance of a major program uh, finding that we have uh, later. But there's three audit opinions we audit at the level of financial statement present preparation. Uh, the financial statements fairly present and are fairly accurate and good and that we also audit at the government level and also at the single audit level. So there's a, several tiers to this audit report, which requires it to be, you know, 70 some pages long. So in pages four through 10, if you want a summary of what happened during the year, the best place to look is on these pages and it gives you a comparative financial information and executive summary of how the operations went for the prior year and the things that are coming up. For example, one of the things coming up, which you know about, we toured some of the sites and facilities that you have under renovation. Very pleased to see the renovations, but a lot of activity and a lot of things going on. And those are summarized in the management discussion analysis. Also on the statement of cash flow, you will notice that there is a $3.2 million increase in operating cash, the operating cash section of the cash flow. So financially very sound and those funds were invested. Most of them were invested during the year or re-put back into facilities. But the general operations of the housing authority is generating a surplus cash, which is good. Uh, there were no prior audit findings, one current finding related to the ACV tenant files. And then the, the last thing I want to mention in regards to what to look at in the audit report is page 58, the schedule of expenditures of federal awards. $182 million is what you received. All the programs that we audited for compliance are noted in, in as major. And this included about $7 million for emergency housing vouchers that was brought in and expended during the year. So we saw a significant increase in the, in the amount of uh, federal funds that were received during this last year. The slide, slide number three, basically it shows you a comparative 
of the balance sheet, the income, the balance sheet of the, the current assets versus the 2023 versus 2022, and you'll you'll notice a a uh, almost a flat uh, amount of increase or decrease to the current assets. The overall um, current liabilities decreased by a million two, but the most significant number I want to point you to is the unrestricted net position down at the bottom of, in the column of 2023. You have about $55 million of unrestricted um, assets, and, and that went up by about $3 million during the year. So very good uh, operating year of financial results. Current assets are strong. Uh, liabilities have been liquidated. The debt has been liquidated and uh, uh, or is being liquidated. And then the slide four deals with the comparative of the income and expense. And you might make a note of the increase in the government grants and subsidy uh, line, $25 million. And $25 million is a significant amount of increase. Most of that came through the HCV program and through the emergency uh, housing voucher program. And one of the things to understand is you're doing everything you can locally to increase the number of affordable units that you have um, that you're under under subsidy and, and available for low moderate income persons. But because of inflation and other thing other factors in the in the local area, there's just a significant, serious lack of housing, and you know this, and that's one of the reasons for the grant application and for the renovations that you're making and for new tax credit applications that you have. The, to offset the $25 million increase in governmental grants, you have a $20 million increase in housing assistance payments and expenditures down, down in the expenditure line. And so those, those two were the significant items of, of uh, materiality during 2023. Also of note, you'll notice the maintenance line has gone up a, a little bit, and that's due to unit turnaround and to getting the units in compliance with the federal standards for um, maintaining the, the, the property standards at the, at the right level. So slide five shows the significant items to note. One current audit finding related to HCV. You, we looked at over 250 files uh, for compliance and this was, this was a major disruption because at the time we were doing the tenant file review, there was a um, trying to go electronically with all the files. So we were in between hard copies of files and electronic uh, copies of files. And there was, uh, there was a, a tough time getting everything we needed in, on a timely basis. We finally got everything. But when we analyzed the files for compliance, we found a 10.4% error rate in those 250 files, primarily related to the calculation of income. And so we recommended a series of trainings and uh, re-examination of some of the some of the files, or quality control inspection of some of the files that that would be needed to make sure that 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 was okay going forward. Now the nice thing about the error rate, if there is a nice thing, is that it was immaterial to the financial statement. So what that means is that the income variance was not of significant amount for the agency's housing assistance payments program. We did have a, a third bullet is a net pension obligation decrease, which impacts the operating statements. And then uh, I mentioned before, there was a, a housing assistance payments increase of $20 million or 15%. Um, the housing authority also had a positive financial result with over 500,000 added to cash all of that came from unrestricted sources, which you continue to hold on to and have a good cash position. And the Housing Authority uh, does uh, house approximately 16,000 households responsible for that in the, in the Las Vegas area. So we are very pleased to have conducted this audit pretty much in a timely basis. The only reason for any delay in the issuance of the report was the pension information was not available until the end of May, 1st of June. So we were up against the de nine month deadline to get this submitted. 
Um, I know that they are making strides for the for the finding, and I, I know this is a, a major concern. We had significant discussions about that and about what to do, and we believe the housing authority is uh, positioned to be able to solve that finding in the future. But uh, at this time, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. Thank you for your presentation, Dale. Are there any questions for Mr. Rector? Yes, this is Commissioner Turner. Um, when you mention a 10.4 error rate, and this is out of the 16,000 households, is that correct? Or out of the 250, the 250 files, files that we examined, 10% of those had an error. Okay, only 10%. Okay. All right. So we still yeah, got like 9%. Which we believe was representative of the whole. Thank you. So we got like a B, a A, B. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I have a question. As far as the training that's uh, needed for, um, so that these errors are not occurring, how soon can we get um, training started for the employees so that these errors are not made in the future? Rosa can speak to that. Hello, Commissioner. This is Rosanne Lane Garcia, Director of Housing Programs again. Um, we have already started those trainings um, last month. A number of our staff already got the training of income calculations. In July, there will be another training session. And by the end of December, we should have 100% of our staff uh, trained on that income calculation. And Rosa, can you also mention some of the restructuring you've done from a leadership standpoint? Sure. Um, we have uh, made some changes. We have two program managers, one program manager two, and a program manager one. We have assigned a, a certain number of um, programs to each of the program managers, and they will be overseeing and doing the quality control with the team of the quality control uh, people. I'm very happy to say that we have hired already a trainer. Um, that should be starting July 8th. So that also is gonna make a difference because we're having continuous uh, training on a regular basis with staff. So, and there's more to come, but we're still uh, working on restructuring more. Thank you. Thank you, are there any follow-ups? I have one more question. So for the households that were um, calculated in error, were they penalized for, like, as far as the income goes, because these are income-based programs and the rent is affected by that, what do we do for the residents who were affected by these errors? How are we addressing that for the residents? We certainly make the corrections and we certainly address those. So if the income goes, in fact, we were just having a meeting with my whole team about those things because that requires adjustments. So the adjustments, if the income goes up or, uh, or the income goes down, and then that means that the client, the tenant had to pay more, mm -hmm. then we definitely go back and make the adjustments. Okay, so, so they're like the credited con whatever they went over or whatever. And if, even if we have to, we even issue a check. Okay, sounds good to me, thank you. So actually following up on that, so being Mr. Uh, Rector that this is a percentage of the whole, so if we're saying we, we pull 250, and, and that's our sample, and we're finding that it's 10% error rate on that, are we going back to review all files now, being that this is a representative of a larger uh, group, if we're so looking at just the data? Part of the restructuring is to go back to 100% quality control, because we currently do 100% of quality control with the contracts when we first have um, uh, the clients, but the annuals and the uh, interims, the, quali the, con the quality control is done on a percentage basis. So once we have our quality control team, the trainer, we're going back to do 100% quality control. Thank you. Um, yes, Mr. Turner. I, I wanted to um, ask, these um, calculations, the rank calculations, are based on the HUD formula. Correct. And they're standard. They don't change because of this or because of that. Whatever hood sets, Correct. that's the calculations we are following. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah. and, and, and saying that um, we can always improve. And um, Absolutely. I'm glad that we are already taking those strides to improve mm -hmm. our performance overall. And sometimes it also depends on when is those changes are reported. So, um, also that makes a difference. So, I want to make sure that we also let clients and tenants know that as soon as they make those reports, uh, the better. 
And just just one more thing to add. I know that um, we were starting everything electronically in the portal and things like that. So I'm hoping that in those trainings that we are also improving our technology that makes it more convenient and um, accessible for you know individuals that want to report and, and utilize the systems because you know they had been reported that there that's were my goal commissioner turner Thank uh we're you. still on uh it's still work in progress we're not 100 percent there yet but we are in good on the in a good road to get that i appreciate it commissioner cox so it is also i think a requirement that when we find a sample where there is a certain percentage we have to go back and do 100 percent is that correct or are uh, we just doing it because that is, the, I mean, that's the right thing to do? Well, you, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, go ahead. Um, so, as you know, I haven't been with Sonora for a very long, but staff tells me that they used to do 100% quality control, and that was uh, something that staff is asking to go back to that. Some, not everybody, but some, most people want to go back to 100%. And, and Dell, can you answer that? Is it a requirement that we do 100%? No. no, it's not. It's not, it's not a requirement. So. Now, uh, let's get a, a little bit of perspective here. Uh, we extrapolated the error rate up to the population, 100% of the population. By doing that, we use a math formula that calculated that the housing assistance payments might have been misstated by 0.07%. So, we significantly uh, immaterial to the overall financial statements. However, we understand that to the 25 tenants, it could be material for them. And so our recommendation is moving forward as you do the re-examinations is to um, do a better job with the quality control and the training. The training mm -hmm. uh, is essential, but you, you, you have to understand, particularly with HOTMA coming in and other things, that the computations can change just a little bit and tweak just a little bit. And so when you have a changing staff and changing regulations, it does, it does make it for um, a potential for, for an error. But I, I, I want to restate that the overall materiality was incredibly insignificant on the, on the whole population. But yet, 10% error rate is, 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 is a problem. We would like to see that down to 5% or below. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you guys would like to see it at 1% or 2%. So. Yes, yes, and I would agree with that. And that was really where I was heading. Because for me, um, it would be for the residents that I would be more concerned about where they're at. But they also know that it's a double-edged sword because it can also go up. Yes. Correct. But I do think the more we yep. are right on which isn't easy but the more mm -hmm. we're right on i think it helps across the board for residents to have that absolutely all right thanks Mr. director sunk you off the hook thank you uh we'll entertain a motion for the approval of the uh independent audit report i so move we've got a motion by commissioner cox Let's there's second. a second by vice chair sagerbloom is there any discussion on that motion hearing saying none we'll move to a vote all in favor aye, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is approved. We'll now move on to item number nine, uh, approval of the uh, operating budget revision for fiscal year ending September 30, 2024. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Fred Heron, Chief Administrative Officer. Um, each year we require, each year we perform a, a, a budget revision um, throughout the, through the middle of the year. Uh, to allow management and, and, and directors to uh, take another look at their programs and their budgets to determine if they have enough funding uh, to get them through the remainder of the fiscal year. Uh, finance provides them with a six-month report showing how much they actually spent, uh, and they project those, uh, project those numbers out to the end of the fiscal year to give the, each manager and department an uh, idea of what they would spend if they continued on the same path. In some cases, um, they may need additional stuff uh, additional um, fund funding for for later months they may want to increase the budget and also they may take a look at uh, some of the other line items where they may reduce what line items where they may have not spent on money during the year uh, it's a simple process it's not a process not a full a full-fledged budget um, that, that we do at the um, 
three months prior to the new, new fiscal year, but it's something to give each part department a chance to kind of take another look at it. Um, this year, um, our public housing program, which represents our, our asset management proper, properties, um, is presenting a budget of $122,342, um, down from one twenty nine. 859, our central office call center, which represents all of our non revenue producing programs. Um, in, the, in the approved budget, we had uh, the board approved 27,391. Um, this year, in the revised budget, um, the budget is 26,829. Um, the Housing Choice Voucher Program, which is one of our largest programs, the board approved in, in fiscal year 2024, uh, $256,000. $517 uh, as a net income for the year. Um, the revised budget is, is reduced down to $148, $48,534. Affordable housing program uh, budget, uh, beginning of the fiscal year, the board approved $48,755 as an operating income um, for that program. Uh, in, in the revision, uh, we're looking to have a net increase, a, a net um, uh, a net income of two, two, $20,238. Our NSP program, which, uh, which we um, ha had a budget in the beginning of the fiscal year of $162,379. And uh, in the revised budget, it was reduced down to $59,191. Um, our total budget um, for the beginning of the fiscal year was $564,000. Uh, $416 as a net income. Um, my net income in our revision was reduced down to $417,367, about $147,000 less than what we had approved in the current fiscal year. Um, I have some, some highlights that I'll go over to talk about some of the major changes that um, was part of the budget revision. In our conventional low end program, uh, dwelling income and, and operating subsidy, uh, we had a total of about $1.3 million of income increase in, in revenue. Uh, operating subsidy is prorated at 98%. I think in the initial budget, we had projected around 95% proration. Um, our housing of choice voucher program uh, had a, an increase in our housing, um, our housing, a HAP housing assistant payment income of about $19,644,000. And also had a, and also an increase in our expenditures as well, um, due to the lease up percentage. We're, we're, we're leasing our, our housing choice voucher program is leased up at, at 100 percent currently. And one thing that also that contribute to the increase in our housing choice, a housing, housing assistance payment, payment um, increase was per unit cost increase about to $1,200 per month. Um, another change that that existed in our housing choice voucher program was a, a change in our, alloc our allocation methodology for our frontline costs. Our frontline costs is costs that we use to charge uh, our mission department, our resident service, and our hearing department who would allow us to uh, charge out those properties to the programs which uh, service they perform. And in that, that methodology change had, a, had a, an effect of $1.2 million increase in the housing choice voucher program expenditures. Uh, was, as, as, you, as Mr. Jordan mentioned earlier, the Southern Valley Regional Housing Authority, we started our pre-apprenticeship, we will, we will be starting our pre-apprenticeship program this um, upcoming July 1st, and so you got a chance to meet some of the, the folks that were part of that program. We allocated about $250,000, uh, the board approved about, about $250,000 um, this past budget year um, for that program, and we, we anticipate to spend about $100,000 uh, towards, toward the salaries um, out of our developer fees for this current fiscal year. Um, housing our affordable housing program, uh, one of the major changes in our housing choice in our affordable housing program, we uh, did an RFP several months ago to do some project-based vouchers on, on some of our development costs. Um, Robert Gordon was one of the ones that um, our initial program that we, that we overlaid about 147 vouchers, which is going to generate about $300,000 of additional income to the program this current fiscal year. Uh, next fiscal year in 2025, we anticipate that, pro that overlay process to generate about $1.5 million to the affordable housing program. We also anticipate 
on overlay and vouchers on some of our scatter sites unit, um, some units at Brown Homes, as well as Janice Brooks Bay. And our agency-wide agency budget is approximately $231 million, um, um, uh, up from um, about $23 million increase from what was approved in fiscal year 2024. Uh, and if you guys have any questions about anything specific, you know, I'm prepared to answer some of those questions. If I uh, don't have answers, I can get back with you and get them to you. Are there any questions? All right, hang your saying none. I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve the operating budget revision for the Southern Valley Ridge House Authority for fiscal year ending September 30, 2024. Motion to approve. We have a motion by Commissioner Bruni. Is there a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Cox. Is there any discussion on that motion? Hearing say no one, we'll move to a vote. Oh. Sorry, just that we are briefed, just so everyone knows, we're briefed ahead of time so that um, this is not new information for us and we've taken a long look at everything. All right. We have a motion and second on the floor. Uh, move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. A motion is adopted. We'll now move on to item number 10. Approval of resolution number 127, the annual agency plan, physical year 2025. Ebony Bell will present this item. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Ebony Bell, Fraud Investigator for the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. So as you all know, the Housing Authority is required to submit an annual plan to HUD um, once a year. Um, therefore, it is currently the Housing Authority's um, time to submit that um, annual plan to HUD. Um, therefore, just to give a little background um, information leading up um, to today, the annual plan was distributed for a 45-day public comment period starting on April 25th, 2024. The plan was provided to the Board of Commissioners, the residents, the clients, the general public, and the RAP members. Hard copies of the annual plan were also distributed to all public housing and all administrative buildings. Public notices went into multiple local newspapers and publications during the month of May and June 2024. The public comment period ended last Monday, June 17, 2024, and there was a public hearing that was held here in the commission chambers. As a quick overview, um, as you know, um, HUD is redeveloping the program, and therefore one of the um, main overviews of the program that they're transitioning into is called HOTMA. HOTMA stands for Housing Opportunity Through the Modernization Act. And under HOTMA, there are a couple of different um, highlights that I do want to um, discuss today. Um, the first one is now PHAs must now base the income calculations for annual reviews on previous year's income instead of projected future income for public housing families and residents. The second is public housing um, families deemed over income for 24 consecutive months are no longer eligible to stay in public housing. One of the third highlights is now HUD provides clear definitions for uh, foster children and foster adults. Also, one of the other main changes or major um, changes the agency made is the Housing Authority, we updated all of our um, policies to include all of the updated language from HUD under the um, VAWA, which stands for Violence Against Women's Act. Even though in the saying it mentions women, um, this act does not only apply to women, it applies to everyone. We've updated all of our internal forms, policies, and procedures um, to include um, the VAWA notification requirements, the terms, definitions, and the forms our agency is required to use. Um, also, one of the things that we did um, update or that we created, because we actually didn't have one before, is our agency created an emergency transfer policy that applies to victims of violence. Also, we included 
the update um, to include human trafficking, which was not previously included in our previous VAWA policies. All of these policies are in compliance with the PIH notice 2022-06, also PIH notice 2022-22, and PIH notice 2022-24. I know that was pretty quick, um, but do you all have any questions for me at this time? Just got a quick question. I just yes. want to get a copy of your slides, if I can. I did attend the meeting. I, we went over the plan. It's thick. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> if you can give me a, a copy of your summary, that would be great for, okay. for me. Okay. Thank Please. you. Thank you. And really quick, um, so when you talk about emergency transfer, is that transfer actually out of state? Unfortunately, it's not. Um, so how the emergency transfer policy actually works is it's transfer only into the program that you're on. Um, so currently, if you are on the public housing program, we can only transfer you to another public housing property if we have availability um, at that property based upon what the suitable needs are for that family. Um, for Section 8, they have more options, fortunately, um, because they do have a housing choice voucher program. And with that voucher, they're able to transfer to any housing authority um, in the United States. Um, so for housing choice voucher, participants is different. Um, but public housing and on the affordable side, they can only transfer uh, within that property. Or, yeah. Yeah, I do a lot with human trafficking and trying to get help to victims. And so that was my concern is yeah. a lot of times in those situations, they want to be out of the state. So thank you for clarifying. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're that. welcome. Any other questions? Yep. All right. Well, All right thank, thank you for you. your time. All right, uh, we're entertaining a motion to uh, approve resolution uh, 127 for fiscal year 2025 annual agency plan. Motion to approve. We have second. a motion by Commissioner Brown, a second by Commissioner Turner. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing and saying none, we'll move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Anyone saying? Motion is adopted. Moving on to development and modernization, uh, approval of award contract number C24010 in the amount of 152000 for the rehabilitation of 4621 Hutchison Drive to Validity Construction Services, LLC. Is there a presentation? Just my mic. I'm offended. Good afternoon, commissioners. Dina Williams, Development and Modernization Coordinator, standing in for Mr. Frank Stafford, Director of Development and Modernization, who is not in attendance today. So, Development and Modernization is presenting item number 11, which is approval to award contract number C24010 in the amount of $152,000 to rehabilitate public housing unit 4621 Hutchinson Drive. That's contract being awarded to Validity Construction. So this is basically a two bedroom, two bath house that has been offline for some time, is needed in significant uh, modernization and, and repairs beyond the capacity of our maintenance staff. And so we put it out to bid. That was for bid number B24010. That was notified or it was publicized on NGEM, which is our online public housing you know, notification platform. As it states, it went out to 5,187 firms, of which 24 downloaded the solicitation package. By the due date of May 6, two firms had submitted bid packages. Those were by Validity Construction Services and T4 Construction LLC. After review of both candidates, it was determined that Validity Construction's contract or the proposal was the lowest and most responsive. And so we have Validity Construction representatives here in the audience today should you have any questions but DevMod is asking to have approval of contract number C24010 in the amount of $152,000 to be awarded to Validity Construction. Thank you. Are there any questions? Commissioner Cox? I do have some questions for Validity really quick. <coughs> Sorry. Hi. Hi. Um, so 
Please um, state your name for the record. Oh, my name is Vanessa Burke, and I'm with Validity Construction. So the condition of this property has to be pretty severe. Yes. At the rate yes. that we're being quoted, right? Yes. <laughs> Correct. Okay. So, um, what is the time frame? I'm just curious about the time frame that's projected for completion. And uh, also, James, six to eight weeks. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be awarded this project. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you for your presentation. We'll now move. we we'll look for a motion, motion for approval. Is there a motion for approval? I'll move. We have a motion by Commissioner Cox. Second. Second by Commissioner Brown. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing saying no, we'll move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Motion is adopted. Move on to item number 12. Approval of resolution number 126, authorizing the executive director to submit disposition applications for the vacant lots located on the corners of Duncan and Edwards, 28th and Sunrise, and former Rose Gardens to HUD. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Dina Williams, Development and Modernization Coordinator, standing in for Mr. Frank Stafford, Director of Development and Modernization, who is not in attendance today. DevMod is asking for approval of resolution number SNRJ 126 for authorization of the executive director to submit a disposition application for the vacant lots located at the corners of Duncan and Edwards, 28th and Sunrise, and the former Rose Gardens property. Basically, a disposition application is uh, our formal request to HUD to dispose of a property. The property is not being disposed of. We're just asking permission so that we can basically cut some of the HUD ties so that we can move forward the process of converting the property under RAD and LIHTC. So it's just a procedural process that we have to go through for each of these properties. We've presented to the board numerous times the same process the HUD will still be involved in the property because the Housing Authority still has an ownership in the property so HUD is not necessarily going away this is just part of the process so we have to formally request HUD's approval to dispose of the property so that we can move forward in the process and we can close financing so that we can convert these properties and build the 400 units that Mr. Jordan alluded to earlier these are those three properties where those 400 new units are going to come those are the 400 units, new units that are going to come online, as Mr. Jordan had uh, made you aware earlier in the proceedings. All right, thank you. All right, Commissioner Bernie. Thank you. I have a question. Is it always the case that, that we keep the land even when we dispose of the property or do a disposition? Yes, we usually retain the ownership of the land as we have to create an ownership entity for the new building because the housing authority can't be the owner after conversion because it's kind of considered double dipping to have these two different forms of financing and investment. So we have to create an owner entity, LLC, for each property when we do a RAD conversion. So the owner will be basically the property management company that we create that is basically owned by Affordable Housing Programs, Inc., not the department, the uh, 501c3 arm of the housing authority but we still have ownership of the land and then we'll generally do a land lease to the new development okay. thank you i will make a motion to approve item number 12. all right we have a motion by commissioner bruni is there a second second by commissioner cox is there any discussion on the motion hearing saying no we'll move to a vote all in favor aye aye, aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is adopted. We now move to item number 13. Approval of the uh, approval to amend the protocol of naming Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority buildings. Dina Williams, Development and Modernization Coordinator, here for Mr. Frank Stafford, Director of Development and Modernization, who is not in attendance today. The Development and Modernization Department is presenting item number 13, which is approval to amend the protocol for naming Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority buildings or assets. Basically, all we're doing is streamlining a process that was already in existence. We're just kind of updating it. So we're making it a little more transparent and a little more inclusive so that more people have the opportunity to submit you know, suggestions when we like 
we mentioned before, there are three properties that are vacant that we're building on right now. We like to basically name them after prominent people in the area, and so this is the process by which we do that, how we select those names. Our existing Luberta Johnson was formerly Miller Plaza. That is the street that is on Perry Plaza. Perry Plaza, and that's the street that it's on. And we used to just name buildings after the streets that they're on, like Balzar. But when we demo something and we come back with a new property, we want to give it a new name so that it has its own separate entity and a separate history going forward, And like we did with the uh, Bennett Plaza. So it used to be Balzar, now it's Bennett Plaza. This is the same process. So all we're doing is just updating this process. Does that come in front of the commission? As we are absolutely. right now, we yes. are bringing this to the once commission. the name once the name is decided. Oh, absolutely, that, that is part. Of absolutely, absolutely. that is part that. of the process. Awesome, thank you. And we are immortalizing that here now, so that we can uh, here going forward. You guys are always aware of the process. You're aware of the uh, the suggestions that are coming on. You yourself may participate. You may make suggestions, and then when the basically the committee finals down to the finalists, that will be presented to the board for approval. Even thank board you. Approval. That's correct. Commissioner Bernie. I have a question, maybe from my fellow commissioners. Are we as a public entity allowed to sell our na naming rights to buildings? I, I don't believe we can sell our naming rights like we can as a city, right? So, because we're a federal, right? Or can well, we? Well, I, I think because, first of all, we're moving away from traditional public housing. And so I, I think there is an opportunity for naming rights, like for community centers, um, buildings, and on the, you know, so commissioner, you're, you're going along the right path. If it were, but even if it were just traditional public housing, I think there is an opportunity. And that's something that as we continue to develop, I'd like for us to consider, particularly, you know, around some of the corporate entities, um, libraries, rooms, you know, things of that nature. So those are good opportunities to not only recognize, but those are good opportunities to create, to create uh, revenue and uh, generation. Great idea. Yeah. Was that a motion, Commissioner Bruni? Yes, I will make a motion. <laughs> All right, we have a motion. To approve item number 13. Uh, there is a motion by Commissioner Bruni. Is there a second? Second, Second by Commissioner Brown. Is there any discussion? Move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is adopted. Item number 14, Thank bring you. us home. Thank you. You did a great job for Mr. Stafford. Great job. Great job. Thank you. You did a good job. Thank you. She preps him well. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pressure, Johnny. <laughs> That's a tough act to follow. Johnny Shaw, procurement manager. Uh, item 14, approval to increase contract C2033 in the amount of $310,000 uh, uh, for agency-wide temporary staffing employment services. Background, as pursuant to contract number C2033, the SNARA's executive, executive office requests approval to increase this contract for the above noted services. Due to the uh, fiscal 24 budget revisions that you have just uh, heard across the agency, temporary staffing uh, has been needed, as well as short staff FT positions that have not been filled across the agency. This increase will cover uh, FY24 uh, projections for the remainder of the fiscal year. Um, pending unpaid invoices and existing purchase orders that have not been invoiced or received on yet. The contract initially was for one year, one year with four renewal options. The original contract <clears throat> was for 150000 back in 2023. And FY24, uh, we renewed for another 150000 Additional increases for FY24, uh, April 24 for 100000 and in May uh, 2024 for 50000 which brings us to the current request of 310000 for the total of 760,000 of total contract for the manpower contract. Manpower is a publicly held company. Also note that 100,000 of this uh, <clears throat> uh, requested increase will uh, be to uh, uh, fund the uh, apprenticeship program, 
which they would be, they were, the apprenticeship program would be going through the manpower agency as well. Action requested, the executive director requests the board to review and approve to increase contract <clears throat> number C23033 for Snower's temporary employment agencies due to the sh being short staffed across the agency to the manpower, manpower of Southern Nevada to be utilized across uh, agency wide in the amount of 310,000 for the remainder of this fiscal year, FY24, September 30, 2024 bringing the entire contract to not to exceed 760,000. Are there any questions? I just, Commissioner Bruni, so I would like to know, uh, and I really appreciate manpower, you know, housing essentially our apprenticeship program. Is that what I'm hearing? Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so um, I just like us to, I understand we're in a you know staffing shortage, but you know, these are, you know, these are good paying jobs that, you know, are going unfilled, uh, that provide a retirement and so forth. So I just want us to make sure that, you know, we're working in a way to, you know, fill these positions so that we're not working with the publicly held company like Manpower. So just want to make sure. Commissioner, point, point well taken. And, and as we're going through this effort just to find good employees, some of the more recent hires we've had, come through that manpower program. So I just want to be very clear, this is not a substitute. You know, if, if we had it our way for, June could probably tell us the amount of openings we have, we would much, much prefer to hire full-time employees, come in, get benefits, become a part of the bargaining team, and just become a part of our structure in general. Yeah. The reality is that it's just not, that, that not easy to do that. So we use this to bring people in, but this is not a substitute for getting full-time regular employees. Commissioner Bruni. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, um, I just wanna know, will the residents be able to benefit from some of these temporary employment services? I believe it can probably help them um, gather some skills that they might be. Um, and I'm not sure if you put out a blast to uh, residents about the jobs that are available here. You can always go online and look, I know that. But um, for people that might be in the FSS program or any other um, people that might be struggling, it might be um, some clients that have been um, displaced from their jobs, if they could also benefit, get the firsthand information if they want it let that resource be available to them so that the way they know they can have a, a way to get um, employment. We'll work with the, uh, the public housing director and make sure that uh, flyers or some, some, nature, <coughs> some nature are put out to the residents whenever we have these positions available at Manpower. Okay. Commissioner Bruni. Thank you. Um, so it sounds like we're paying Manpower $100,000 a year to run the apprenticeship program and is that per like sort of in perpetuity or at some point is there somebody on staff maybe unfilled position that would run or manage the apprenticeship program no we are not paying we are not paying manpower a hundred thousand dollars we budget we put in the budget a hundred thousand dollars just in case um we utilize that, that, that bottom money but we only pay them for the bottom money that we're going to use them so we got 10 folks and it's probably be less than it's forty thousand dollars, but yeah, it's, we won't we won't be paying them a total of hundred thousand dollars. We pay them based on the use how much we use them for. Okay, and then is the plan to eventually, once we're fully staffed, have someone internally run that program? Or are we always going to use manpower to run the apprenticeship program? What what manpower is, is to, as as long as we have funds to. To operate the apprenticeship program, we will they will go through manpower. Once we utilize the two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand dollars that the board set aside, once those funds are gone, then the apprenticeship program would, would dissipate unless we receive more money from the county or the city. I know that's one thing we kind of reached out to the, juris, the, the, the various jurisdictions to see if they could kind of help assist us with this program. But we have set aside two hundred fifty thousand dollars for this manpower program, for this uh, apprenticeship program. Uh, once we utilize those those funds, then then, that, then the program would be cease to exist. But I guess I'm a little confused because I know we're using manpower to fill temporary positions, vacancy, yes. but it sounds or vacancies. But it sounds like we're we're they're running the program for no, us. No, we, our residents are going through manpower, and then we are we are hiring. We are, 
We're bring contract with, with, with manpower to uh, for those services. And also, this goes towards our initial conversations okay. with Workforce Connections, who literally should have been our partner in this in this mm -hmm. you know in this operation because they're already it's a regional entity. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, we get it and we appreciate it. I'm not Workforce sure. Connections. When we we were initially having meetings with Workforce Connections to try to identify creative ways to do things like this, uh, some year over a year ago. So. Um, I'm glad that we we're able to get something stood up, but you know, as we look to the future, it would just make sense for us to work more closely to a workforce connections because they could literally be our partnering training agent entity. And that relationship is still there, but in the in the interest of time yeah, and yeah. moving this forward, this is what we want to. Yeah, I got you, but, Commissioner Cox. May I thank you? So we don't have. So we obviously have a we're a contract with them, or we're going to. Do we already? We currently have a contract with Manpower. Okay, so we're enhancing that contract. We're adding to that contract by bringing contract. on, okay, yeah. the apprentice program. But once two hundred and fifty thousand dollars is gone, then that program ends. Mm -hmm. the so there's no longevity, uh, right? Well, hopefully those folks, those employees, those participants will be part of our, our labor staff. Now, yeah, and I understand staffing is hard. Like, you know, I have businesses and I get it, but there's got to be a better way. And so I really. A better way to. I mean, just having to pay, like, workforce connections, they do that as a so service. They, we don't pay them pay, to do you that. Pay, you pay workforce to connections to. I don't think we pay people. them. No, I think, I, I, think, I think we're not going to get it solved at this meeting. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I do believe that they're there should be a conversation that's had to where you know we already know that you know workforce connections deals with unemployed and right. underemployed dislocated workers right. within a certain group uh, age group but this is going to be a much longer conversation okay right. that's not going to get addressed today well, well then I just want she's getting to then I just want to get on the record yeah. that I would like to see moving forward a different way of doing this because i think having to pay an, a company i get that you need that now and i'm completely supportive because i was briefed so i am supporting it i'm not changing that but as we get you know i think we can't rely on municipalities is what i'm saying because i know what it's like to try to get money from municipalities at least mine right so and i don't mean that derogatory but i know the budget that for this year so moving on forward i think we need to do talk in at length about workforce services and how to incorporate them and not rely on a paid for um staffing agency which i really like them but they're expensive is my problem i just i'm paula tucker the director of supportive services i just wanted to add that we did approach um several i mean the workforce uh connections um, um job connect and it, i just want to say that um, before they approve any kind of training, they have to go through and complete the work keys um, testing, and then they have to be approved for training. It's very hard for our residents to complete that process. So um, that's why we established the apprenticeship program, because they're very selective on who they approve training for and who they pay for training. So that's kind of how we moved into this direction um, to establish the apprenticeship program. Because like I said, right now with, with WIOA funding being very tight, they're very, very selective um, into who they actually move into training. So even when we had the, the, the names from the, um, the wait list um, and we had people um, working with us on that, that very few people got actually moved into training even and then we had the person in in staff i mean in-house from from um employee nb they we still didn't have a lot of people that were actually um enrolled in training because of the selection process and the uh, um, inability for people to pass the work he's testing so that's exactly why we moved into the pre-apprenticeship program okay, okay thank you so much you're welcome i just have a quick question Commissioner Brown. Um, so I just want to make sure I'm clear that manpower, the positions that they're filling for us, are these temporary positions? And if they are, are the client or the candidates able to make this into a permanent position? The, the goal is to move them into our permanent positions okay. as maintenance aid, yes. Okay, thank you. And I wanted Lee to give some clarification, Commissioner Turner, to your question you asked earlier about jobs. Mm -hmm. So every, oh, Lee Quick, 
Housing Authority. <laughs> so every um, month we have our monthly newsletter and on the back of the newsletter, which is printed as well as uh, electronic, we have all the jobs that are available. So, so I think one of you asked that question, Commissioner. Yes, it definitely goes to all of our residents, the jobs that are available. Thank you, I appreciate that. Just to clarify that these resources are available if, if, if right. thought about, basically, Absolutely. is there. Thank you. Can I say something else? I, I wanted to say something else about this. Overall, I think the biggest picture we need to look at is the fact that we, as a housing authority, might be able to be in a position to train our own. And so that's what I believe the, the biggest picture is, is that we'll be able to um, run our own program on our own, but we need this as a start, as a, as, a, as a platform, as a stepping stone to move into the direction that I believe it will benefit the agency and the residents is if we can create our own program from within and um, we can start getting some of that funding. You know, we have a lot of, you know, jurisdictions over here that can probably rustle up some, uh, you know, good money for us, workforce development, et cetera. So thank you so much. I just have one more clarification, Lee Quick. Um, all of the participants currently in the apprenticeship program are our housing authority residents. So they're either in the Section 8 or Housing Choice Voucher Program or they're in the Public Housing Program. I just want to make that, that clear. Thank you. All right, I entertain a motion. Move for approval. We have a motion by Vice Chair Sagerblum. Is there second. a second by Commissioner Turner? Any discussion on that motion? Hearing saying no, move to a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Motion is adopted. We'll now move on to our second period for public comment. I have a few cards here. Oh, are there any new business items? Excuse me. New business? New business? Old business? All right. We're now moving to public comment. This is the t <laughs> my business. <laughs> uh, this is the time set aside right, set aside for. Public comment, uh, you will be uh, called. The first I have on the list is Michael Mortensen. Michael Mortensen. And Ricky Johnson. Thank you. Please. Yeah, thanks for uh, letting us be heard in this issue. Uh, I'm Michael Mortensen, this is Ricky Johnson. We both reside at La Bertha Johnson Complex. We just formed a citizen um, council, so we're both members of that. And, Hope to see you from time to time. The thing what I'm addressing is uh, Ricky Johnson was uh, attacked by Metropolitan Police Department on uh, uh, Southern uh, Nevada housing property at La Bertha Johnson. He was tackled down in hard gravel, uh, handcuffed. Yeah, it, was, it happened January 4th, 2023. He was tacked, uh, when he tried to identify himself, the uh, going into his pocket precipitated a takedown in hard gravel, after which he was searched for drugs, even a mouse search by an undercover officer. He was then taken down to detention and held for six hours and charged with obstruction. This all was precipitated by supposedly not having a light on his bicycle. No charges were ever executed on that obstruction. Now, Ricky Johnson wants uh, compensation from the police department. This is a hate crime that could involve a federal jurisdiction. HUD uh, Inspector General, uh, the Justice Department, he don't want to go through that type of thing and, and serious litigation resulting in huge judgments. He wants a settlement. He wants you guys to lobby the police department to settle this issue be before it becomes an issue like in 2017 when the Justice Department was called in for reforms for just this same type of practice. This uh, racial profiling and reforms were made to where these cameras, um, citizen review board, and we want you to try to get this thing settled so it won't cost the tax mayors a, a fortune. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ayana. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Hello, my name is Ayana Phipps. 
From July 2023 to March 2024, I served as an occupancy specialist here at Sonara. I was also a participant, um, a position I value deeply, not just as a means to support my family, but also I believed in the mission of providing housing assistance to those in need, as is myself. However, my commitment to this mission led me to face an unimaginable ordeal. After filing a complaint against a housing choice voucher supervisor for mishandling my confidential file and, sub, um, and being targeted and discriminated, my life took a drastic turn. She threatened to send me to a close friend in, her, in the fraud department and within seven days after my complaint, she followed through on that threat. This action led to my termination as both an employee and a voucher holder. As a single mother of three, one who is disabled, this situation has been devastating. The security and stability that my job and housing voucher provided were abruptly stripped away from me. Now I find myself ho homeless and struggling to provide for my family, all because certain employees are able to bend and manipulate federal policies for their own personal agendas. What's more disheartening is the involvement of certain individuals from the executive office, such as Lee Quick and Rosa Garcia, who's further compounded the situation with their questionable actions. Instead of seeking justice or fairness, they seem to be more interested in protecting their own interests. This is not just my story, but this is a sharp reminder of the vulnerability faced by many of, the, of us who depend on public services and the importance of integrity within these programs. When those who are entrusted with public welfare misuse their power, it undermines the very foundation of trust and justice that these, situ that these institutions are built upon. I stand before you today and my hope is not just to share my story, but advocate for greater accountability and transparency within our housing authorities. As a caseworker, I've seen firsthand how voucher holders' fates are not depend upon these policies or rules, but it depends on which supervisor or caseworker you receive, which is unacceptable. Thank you for listening. I hope together we can work towards ensuring that these injustices don't happen to others in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Kathleen Caldwell. Good evening, Commissioner. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Kathleen Caldwell uh, Robinson. Uh, I come before the committee in regards to what the on the behalf of what the young lady is just talking about. Every time I call down to the Southern Nevada Regional Housing, I get either Chris or Rosita or uh, 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 Emma and Aaron. I get on the phone as my part to call and. Uh, find out what number am I on the Section 8 housing voucher list. I stand before you as a veteran's wife, widow. I stand before you as a senior, age 63. I stand before you as a master's of education degree. I stand before you as a mother of uh, two adult grown children. And I stand before you for living at the late Tony Pond apartment for the last eight years. Every time I call, I get different kind of answers. Currently today, on the list, I'm 3,352. Now when I call in, they say to me that they have a point system. And I said, well, I qualify for your point system because I'm all your criteria. They have a criteria to say go by the age, they go by you being a senior, they go by you being a veteran, they go by you by your education, they go by you by your employment. Well, I'm retired. I retired in 2011 as a social worker three for the state of Washington. This is my husband who passed away as a veteran in the Army, May 18, 2016. So it's like it's contradicting every time you call and you want to find out, okay, when is my name going to get called? Because this point system is not working for a senior like me. And also they tell me about the lottery. Well, I put my name in both of the lotteries because my uh, manager, Cindy, over at Lake Tonopah to make sure that all of our seniors uh, I'm do sorry, get if into you could the just, pool. If you could just take a few seconds just to wrap up your thoughts, we, uh, your time sure. expired. Thank you. 
You know, so in the meantime, I just think that the system needs to be changed. I think that there also need to be a development system said first come, first serve with the applications, especially for the seniors. You know, because for us to have to be 3,500 or 332 or 337 on the list, my rent is going up All right, again in September. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michelle Beach. Hi, commissioners. Hi. Oh, my name is Michelle Beach. I'm here from Bennett Plaza. And we're here to talk about a lot from Bennett Plaza. We need help. We need a lot of help with the, with the management and the maintenance and how things are being run at Bennett Plaza. There's a lot that we have to go through at Bennett Plaza. We're trying to form a board at Bennett Plaza. And we need the director, someone, to come out to talk with us or to help us out and how things can be better in Bannon Plaza. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you would just hang back, someone will talk to you at the conclusion okay, of the meeting. You. Angela Gooden. Angela Gooden. Is there an Angela Gooden? All right. I'm Kenneth Bailey. There. Kenneth Bailey. Welcome. Hello, thank you. Uh, I'm Kenneth Bailey. I live in Rule on Earl Mobile Home Park. And I've noticed in the last year there's been uh, numerous mobile homes moved out of there and the spots are just empty. They're just sitting there. And I was wondering if you could tell me it was is there any plans to close up that park or to do something that way? And then my second thing that I got to ask about is over the last probably two years, the highway has been doing a lot of work on the highway up above us. There's been big machinery there uh, uh, making all kinds of vibrations and everything. And the streets going down there have started cracking all the way across in places and stuff like that. And the different mobile homes, they've started settling and doing all kind of strange stuff. And I was wondering, is there any way that maybe they can do something about uh, that? And that? That's all that I had to ask about. Thank you. Thank you. If you can just hang hang tight after the meeting, someone will come have a conversation with you. Mm, thank you. All right. Last name Franklin. Tanita, is it Tanita? Hello, hi, my name is Tanita Franklin. I'm sorry that my son was disturbing y'all. He have a disability and I don't have a dark daycare. I never apologize for you, son. Okay. Um, I'm coming because I've been discriminated against. I was in a situation, it's too much for me to say because I'm on the time limit, but I have a disability and my son has a disability. But I was discriminated against. I don't look like I have a disability, but people, I, I used to work. Basically, I'm trying to stay focused. But when I came in, the, the worker, the staff, everybody, they was totally not professional. My son threw up in the in the area and we was told we had to get out the building. I refused to because I had to wash him up. He had on pull-ups. But the worker that came out, she was totally disrespectful. She ridiculed me for not having a doorbell. Mind you, I was homeless three months because when you in transition, traveling from state to state, you end up being homeless. A lot of things need to be addressed, and I don't understand what special accommodations is for, and the program need to be assessed because I'm not getting special accommodations other than the bedroom. I have people with disabilities getting abused, and no one seemed to know nothing about it. And also, my original 
complaint was hidden. No one seemed to can't find it. And I just want to know that a lot of things is going on at the bottom, but we are at the bottom. We, this program would not exist without the clients and things need to be addressed. And that's what I have to say, but some going to be done and I'm going to be coming to all these meetings because we the one, this service will not be without us as the clients. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, please stay uh, back as well so someone can come and have a conversation with you. Uh, Tamika Douglas. Greetings, commissioners. My name is Tamika Douglas. I'm a resident of 2720 Sword Street. It's a um, house on the home program. I've been living there for 23 years. In May, um, May 29th, I got a no cause, a 30 day no cause eviction notice. I don't understand why I called and spoke with my manager. She said I was over income, but I still 23 years, I, my whole life is in that house. I need more time than just 30 days. I asked her if I could have 60 days. She said she needed to speak with Ms. Stevens, Patricia Stevens. She, I spoke with, she spoke with her. She said she would give me 60 days because my husband is 60, so I get 60 days. Still, I asked for not, um, 90 days because I need 90 days to get out. She told me, I, when I talked to her, she told me that I wasn't over income for the program. That wasn't the issue and that she was not obligated to share with me why I need to, to vacate. And I'm, I've been a good tenant. My rent is on time, no disturbance issues. The house is in good condition. I don't understand. I don't understand if you guys are in the business of housing people, you're displacing me and my family. Y'all wasn't given the option of paying more to like fair market rent or maybe another place I can go, I, nothing. So I just, I wanted some clarification on that. Thank you. Uh, again, if you can hang tight. So if, if we can't go back and forth and I talk understand. to you during public coming, but if you hang tight, I will uh, somebody do. will talk to you. Will do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Donna McKinnon. And I suppose Phyllis Carpenter. We'll take a mic. Just hang tight right there. We'll bring the mic to you. Okay. Hi, uh, <clears throat> I'm Donna McKinnon. I live at Sartini Plaza. And um, my manager there, uh, I moved from one apartment to another, uh, to a bigger apartment. And she gave me a uh, notice that I owe uh, $600 for damages to the uh, property or to the apartment. And I've got the pictures. And if you look at the pictures, you could see it's just normal wear and tear. And I've been there for nine years. Okay. And, and it clearly states in, in the, the uh, maintenance, uh, the one that... It, yeah, the maintenance repair list, that if you're there for more than 24 months, that they can't charge you for any wear and tear. So I don't understand why I'm being charged. You know, it was 18, well, it was 1400 and it went down uh, to 640 and now it's at 600 Plus, I don't even know the... the the uh, two hundred dollar deposit that I I made, that's not even talked about. So if I could get some clarification on that, yeah. Oh yeah, they already made me do the the uh, pre payment agreement for you pay $125 and then you pay so much a month, which to pay $600, that's more than what my rent is. I mean, I, I don't understand that. You know, and why wasn't the 200 put on there for uh, taken off of, uh, uh, of that bill? It should have been only 400 if that's the case. But if you saw the pictures, then you would understand there shouldn't be a bill at all. And yeah, I tried to do a walkthrough. She didn't do it with me. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Phyllis Carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were really Oh, it's gone. 
Phyllis Carpenter, 5200 Alpine. Um, so I got moved. Um, when I went to move, that I'm not going to go through everything that happened during the week of the move. It was out of line, the things that they put me through. Um, I was supposed to be to my son's graduation in California Tuesday the 7th. They didn't even get me moved until the 6th because the manager, I was scheduled to move on the 30th. The manager at Sartini had the power disconnected that Monday. I was supposed to move Tuesday. So I couldn't move in because they had the power disconnected. And as per your policies and procedures, I hadn't even signed a lease yet. So I should have at least gotten two days to have it transferred into my name. And I feel like everything that week was done intentionally. And I missed my son's graduation. He already had a drive through graduation because of COVID. And he won't even talk to me now because I missed it. Um, the stuff that they did to me was so out of line. Anyways, okay, so the apprentice, let me just try to go through my notes. Um, apprenticeship program, who, how did they get those applicants? Did they send out, you know, a notice to everybody to where anybody could apply? Because I didn't see anything. Um, and, uh, Okay, so when I went to do the walkthrough with May in, in, at Sartini, I asked her, can I have the construction report where you had the underground leak fixed? Um, she said, no, we didn't do it that way. We had the plumbing lines ran from the top down. Well, the plumbing lines wasn't, wasn't leaking last year in May. If you look at the reports, they, there was no leaks when they opened up the walls and it came back to 6,000 and 4,000 mold spore count. That isn't what it was. It, they, it said that there was some sort of leak, but they didn't know. And they didn't even repair it. If they did it like that, it isn't even repaired. I went and I got a moisture meter, same thing. Um, I have videos where I can show you. It's very frustrating to me. And then, did, and then I asked for the invoices where they had the repairs done. They spent $38,000. The cabinets in my kitchen, I, I want any one of you to come and look at the apartment. It, the cabinets ain't even square. The stove, you can't even push it all the way back because the cabinets aren't square. And the electrical outlet, is covered if the stove did push all the way back. Um, the pantry, they put two linen closets, 17 and a half inches each, and there's a divider in the middle for my linen closet. You try to open the pantry door, it hits the refrigerator. Um, there, it, there needs to be some sort of quality control. Um, somebody going back and checking these units before they, um, before we have to move in. Another thing is they're using semi-gloss exterior paint. Per their policy, they're supposed to use eggshell Navajo white. And the reason for that is because you can go back and you can touch up an eggshell. You can't touch up an, a, a semi-gloss. You have to go corner to corner wet, otherwise it shows. They spot painted the apartment. Um, there's just numerous things that policies and procedures is all I have to say, and they need to be followed. Thank you. Uh, last name Goodlow. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Commissioners, Executive Director, Executive Staff. My name is Sharia Goodlow, and I, I am a resident of the Housing Authority. I'm also a former um, president. I used to be the president of a Marble Manor Resident Council. I used to be the first resident commissioner that the Housing Authority selected. I have given more than 10 years of service to and dedication to our community with strategic planning and a lot of things. Today, I have not been here in a while and I'm disgusted and appalled at the nature of this environment and the things that I have just seen today. Um, I'm giving you guys your guys' badge back. I thank God that he is my resource and my provision. I am a wedding planner um, before I, I took on this apprentice. It took almost a month, almost two months after coming into this boardroom just to get to the human resource. Prior to me accepting an apprentice program, I have personally applied for numerous simple jobs as of just being a clerk, a secretary. I have got training with Nanny McCain. Um, I have been to DC representing this agency. Um, there is a lot of things I know about housing and I took pride in it. Um, not to get hired all the numerous of times I applied for a job here within this agency and to hear the discussion about 
the wah wah about the residents on this, the residents on that. Um, I have seen the same employees been trained for 15, 20 years. This is disgusting how we are wasting money. Um, this morning, just to see just your human resource alone, when you walk in that office, there is a lot of wasted time. If I was a manager and if I was an owner, I would be really disturbed about the wasted time that goes on. Just today of what I've seen, a whole hour of your HCV uh, employees all on their cell phones, all morning. We're, the government, my taxes is going so they could just chill on their cell phones all morning. Then I drive to your site to pick up trash just for a little bit because the maintenance man's already ain't doing nothing. I'm telling you now, you guys can keep your pay. I don't want your pay that you're supposed to give me today. You guys can keep it. Just like the rest of my time that this agency I now see have wasted. I am completely appalled. Completely appalled. This is supposed to be a resident driven agency that I helped sit in the exact safe seat you guys are in to help fight for. And I'm appalled on how you guys allow the community action agency to come in and just do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Now some of these folks may not understand what's going on, but I completely understand and I am disgusted. Mm -hmm. I will, will now take my time to come back into this boardroom if I got to go back hitting door to door to make sure that resident participation is up, I would do that. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Bill Miller. I was going to say, if you if you want to talk, I was going to say, well, thank you, thank you. Let's maintain the decorum. All right, uh, Bill. Hello, commissioners. Um, I'm homeless. I've been homeless for quite some time. I'm lucky to have family and friends that have helped me with showers and places to go, places to cook. Um, I applied for assistance with emergency housing probably about three years ago. In November, I was accepted into the program, only to be told that there were, the funding was not available and they could not do anything. I was not giving, given a time frame when it would be available or what was, what was going on. Um, there was some flooding at your guys' um, eastern building and I could not get in touch with anybody. Um, I was accepted into the program in, I believe, January or February, where I was given 90 days or first to have a meeting, and it was just next door. At that meeting, 20 people got grouped together. There was no individual discussions with people. It was just herded in as cattle, told a basic thing, gave us our paperwork, and that was it. And they told us who our um, case workers were and sent us on our way. I tried to get assistance to find an apartment that was um, within the price range that you guys had told me. For myself, um, it was 1320 for a single bedroom apartment. I found a single bedroom apartment. It was a little bit more than what it was supposed to be. They were willing to lower the price. They did lower the price to, to the 1320 that was shown on my paper. However, um, after reviewing with the case worker, that was a mistake. It was actually 1305. The apartment had talked to their property manager and because they had lowered it once, they could not lower it a second time for me. Um, I had to relinquish my, the hold that I had on the apartment and um, it was very difficult. Um, about since I had put the release on, they put it back on the market and this particular apartment, their next listing was actually lower and I did qualify. I'm in the process of doing this right now. My caseworker has given me until today to have my paperwork turned in. I've asked for another extension because I've had an extension. My point are is you guys have told me what the guidelines were on, a, on the price of an apartment. It was 1320. I found an apartment for 1320. Come to find out, it was 1305. Couldn't get a second reduction. 
Um, I tried to get help to find apartments. It's very difficult to, to find help. Then I went to the um, CCSS, the Clark County Social Service Department, to try to get help on rent. They're telling me that they're four months behind with helping people, that they're still working on people in January. You guys give us three months to find a place and to find rent. I'm on emergency housing. I'm disabled. I'm trying to get Social Security. I have no income. And I can't even get help from another organization that should be able to help me. I'm just very frustrated that I was not given the correct amount on my, um, how much I had f to get a housing. Um, and I'm also, like I said, I, I know this is not part of the Clark County um, Civil Service Department that can help with rent, but if you guys have friends, it's very frustrating that they're four months behind when you give me three months to do this and I have no income and I need to rely on another service such as that and I can't. I, I can't go to them. They're four months behind to help anybody. I don't understand why, as if it's a staffing issue, but that really should be addressed because people are here are um, disabled and not completely able to do things on their own and they need the help. Um, so that's all I have is the accuracy on the Section 8 vouchers and maybe help people locate housing. We're, we're told to go to apartments.com and it's such a waste of time. I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and then I do find an apartment and an application fee is $55 but yet they tack on an administration fee for $200. It's not right that we're getting robbed on this. You know, and then if they don't accept us, which I wasn't accepted, they said, oh, we did lower, we did lower your rent. We're not giving you that $200 because we did accommodate you. It's not our fault that the SNRAHA um, was not accurate on their pricing. So they weren't going to give me that $200. Luckily, a couple days later when they relisted it because they have some computer algorithm that prices things, it did fall underneath the 1300 and I was able to get it. However, it wasn't right for all this stress and maybe you guys can have something a little bit more smooth or talk with other agencies, give people uh, another resource because the resources that you give, you give a, a, a one page of what's available at the building across the way. It's a one page thing and it's not updated weekly. It's updated whenever they feel like it, I guess, because I came in and the same paper was up for 10 days and then the following day it was new and I come in 10 days later and it's not new. So there's, we need help. I'm just saying the people that have the vouchers and what you're trying to do with this. And when I contact my, my caseworker, I don't get responses. I contacted, I believe it was her boss and they have no solutions for me. So I don't know what it is that you guys do. You hand me my thing and say, here, good luck, and you kick people out to the curb. It's just something that you guys might want to look into for further people that get vouchers or that are in these emergency housing programs. You know, we need help finding these places. Um, you have a list of everybody that's registered. Maybe share it with us a little easier, make it a little easier for us. And again, the CCSS, that needs to be fixed as well. And if you guys have friends over there, maybe they need to hire some more people to get caught up and they're four months behind. Thank you for your time. I'm sorry for going over, but I'm just frustrated with this. Thank you. Is seeing no one else for public comment. Is there anyone else for public comment at this time? All right, this meeting is adjourned.